Hey guys, welcome to episode number 560. Today is Monday, so it's update Monday. And this is a very exciting week because we are headed home for the holiday. That's right, we're going on a little adventure. We're going to the woods of Maine and we're gonna get outdoors and we're going to explore nature. One of my New Year's resolutions this year is to get outdoors more, to document, to explore, to relate everything I can find and see back to aquariums and our hobby. So hopefully I can accomplish that in this video. But before we get started, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Also, if you'd like to help support this channel, go check out myaquariumbox.com. All right. We got a trip to go on, so let's get going. So come along with me and learn how to be a better aquarist. So here we are out in the woods of Maine. This is a little dirt road off in the woods behind my parents house and these are the woods that I remember. Big tall pine trees, we got some wetlands, a whole bunch of different trees mixed together. Nothing too remarkable but it is what I remember. And then we have this. We got some clear cutting going on. We've got some selective cutting going on. There's a company that came in here on another person's land and has been harvesting trees basically all year long. Just uh, hauling loads and loads of trees out here and this is uh, I believe uh, one of two lumber yards that they have going on. This is where they haul all of the trees out of the woods, stack them up, and get them ready to go on trucks. So needless to say, all of this used to be trees and now it's just completely wide open. So we're gonna continue down the road. We're gonna go find the pond and the stream and we'll take a look at how close this logging operation got to those locations. But as you can see right here, it's just completely transformed the landscape this is just gonna be completely bare ground after they've taken all these trees out of here. And it's quite the difference because this used to be just forest as far as the eye can see. Anyways, guys, let's keep walking around, see what we can find. Alright guys, we are at the pond. This is one of the three places that I used to fish as a kid. It's kind of hard to see it, but we've got a bunch of snow and ice. But here is the outline to this pond. It's a nice big pond. It's fed by a stream, but it's almost completely cut off from the stream. There's a little waterway that connects through here but there's also some ground in the way. So it stays full year round. Uh, it's actually a pretty good place for ice skating. And uh, there are fish in here, but obviously it's frozen over and uh, they're down for the winter. So <laughs> we're not gonna do any fishing, but uh, you can see some of the ice uh, over in this corner is a little bit melted. 
That's probably because it's uh, connecting to the uh, the waterway uh, over that way. But this is a nice location. We've actually got a lot of alder trees around the sides of this pond, and we'll go take a look at some alder cones uh, attached to those. But yeah, it's a nice area here. We've got basically uh, a whole bunch of grass here up this hill, and uh, it's a nice place to hang out uh, in the winter and the summer. And it's a nice little secluded spot here in the woods. Now, all of the cutting that's going on has not affected this pond whatsoever, which is really nice to see. Now up this hill, you can see it starts to open up. You can see the sky. And uh, over that hill is where a lot of that cutting has happened. But I don't think you can cut within so many feet of uh, like wetland habitat. So all of these trees, these full grown sized trees are all basically protected here. Uh, they can never be cut down. So it preserves this little spot at least from being harvested or being uh, disrupted. So all of the wildlife that lives under here, under the ice, under the snow is protected, which is always nice to see. So this is a look at the pond. All right guys, so there's the pond and there's the stream that connects to the pond. It's very low, uh, but up here we actually have an example of an alder tree. Now, if you guys have uh, blackwater aquariums, if you keep shrimp, you're probably familiar with alder cones, and those come from alder trees. And alder trees, they typically stay pretty small. As you can see, it looks like a, uh, almost like a, a shrub, but it is a tree. They just stay small. They uh, typically live near water uh, in very wet wetlands. And uh, this is uh, an example of an alder tree here. Now, if we look closer, you can see there are actually two different types of uh, cones attached to this tree. These long skinny ones are the male cones. And then the ones that look more familiar are these round cones right here. These are the female cones. And those are the ones that I believe actually have the seeds. So alders are kind of strange in that uh, these things stay on the tree year round and it's only until like next year where they actually fall off and they start to fall apart. So uh, it is kind of difficult to collect alder cones because they don't just all fall off the tree all at the same time. If you can see all over the place here, all these alder trees, all these cones are just still all attached to these trees. Now. These male cones aren't worth anything. Uh, people don't use these in aquariums whatsoever. Uh, these are useless. Uh, they fall apart really easily, they crumble, and uh, you know that's not what we're looking for. However, if we take a look at these uh, female cones, these are the ones that people like, these are the ones that people use. Uh, they're a little bit woodier in nature. They hold up a lot better. They don't crumble, uh, at least when they're freshly harvested. These ones look like they're at least a year old. They've probably been on the tree for an entire season and they're completely opened up. All of the seeds are gone and these things are gonna start to fall apart. Um, you know, they're, they're still attached to the tree, but they're really no good, at least for, for an aquarium. So there certainly is a time of year to harvest these things. Uh, it's not right now, but this is a look at what alder cones look like attached to the actual alder tree. Pretty cool to see, and uh, you wouldn't notice it unless you look real close, but nature and aquarium stuff is all around you. All right, so while we're talking about alder cones and alder trees, I thought it would be interesting to take a look at some cones. Now, the alder family has dozens of different species of trees, and as such, uh, the trees are different and the cones are different. The alder trees near my home on the east coast are primarily gray alders. And this is an example of what the cones look like. 
from a gray alder tree. Now, I believe these look very similar to red alder cones as well. Red alders being more prevalent on the west coast of the United States, but it's very common to find them on their stems with little clusters of three or four cones. Now, when we we're in the woods, I mentioned that there were male and female cones. Those are actually called catkins. So, just a brief little piece of info there on the uh, the name of these things specifically. Now, as we move over here, we have a much larger variety of alder cone. And these, I believe, are black alders. These are more native to the Europe and Asia region. And if you look at the size comparison between the two, you can see um, the black alder cones, at least these ones here, are about twice as big as the gray or the red alder. Now, this is subject to some interpretation because uh, there are different sized trees, there are different sized cones, and there are a lot of different species of alder. But in general, I believe that the black alder uh, has larger cones than the gray and the red. And one other thing which is interesting to look at when we're talking about alder cones and tannins and adding um, these things to our aquariums are other different options. And this is one that I came across recently. This is not an alder cone. This is an ironwood cone or, or more uh, commonly known as a casserina cone. And these things are more of a tropical cone and you can tell the difference because these things are very spiky uh, to the look and they don't look like a traditional cone. They look like a big club of spikes. But these also produce tannins and they are very similar to alder cones. So we've got three really good options for adding tannins to our water, to our aquariums, to our shrimp tanks and each one has its own properties and its own benefits, but it's sort of interesting to compare them side by side. All right, and here is the second location from my childhood. This is the stream, and this used to be a giant body of water here, and now it's just down to a trickle. Now all of the harvesting of wood is going on up there, um, all the way back behind there. The pond is over there, and we got a lot more to look at back up here, away from the water. But this area used to have a beaver dam. Now this bridge is newly constructed. In my childhood there was a bridge here it was a logging bridge, but it was really old, and it was actually starting to fall apart. Uh, this is a nice new bridge that they put in to haul trucks of wood across this stream. But what happened was the beaver dam got knocked out. I don't know if they did that or if the beavers had previously left and it had started to fall apart. But right here, where the side of the bridge is, used to be one giant beaver dam. And when beavers dam up waterways like this, a little stream, just a trickle of water like this, all of a sudden starts to flood. The water level just rises to the height of the dam that's put in. So all of this snow all along these banks where you don't see any big trees, it's just little shrubs, all of this used to be underwater. And this is the location that I first caught a fish. Now I had a little Mickey Mouse fishing pole and uh, it was probably just a little shiner or a little chub or some sort of little minnow but uh, we basically stood on the edge of 
this bridge that was half falling apart or stood on the beaver dam, which was right here. And we were able to cast out into the deepest part of the water, which was right here where the stream is currently running through. Um, obviously, all of this being underwater, you could cast over there, but it was a lot uh, shallower water. So this was the best waterway here, but tons of little fish living in here. Probably some larger fish as well, but um, probably not anymore. Not that the water is so shallow, but while this was dammed up, I'm sure there's quite a bit uh, living in here. I do want to come back here in the spring, in the summer, sometime when it's not as cold and uh, maybe do a little bit of fishing down here. But this bridge, this new bridge, is the biggest change down here for sure. You can see they put in big retaining uh, bricks on the sides. They put nice big planks of lumber down and completely built this bridge up so that the trucks could get over and the water could get under. And uh, I think they did a good job with this bridge. This is a bridge that's gonna be here probably for another 20 or 30 years, I would imagine. So uh, it's good in that regard. Now people can pass through this area uh, on this dirt road. Um, when this, when the old bridge had fallen apart, this was just like water right here. And you had to step across stones to get across here. So now that this bridge is here, it really does open up access back here for ATVs and for uh, cross country skiing and all kinds of other activities. Now, while we're on the topic of fishing, I thought it would be fun to dig out my childhood tackle box. This thing is ancient. It's probably a collector's item at this point, uh, but I actually do still use it, which is kind of funny. It is the Fenwick Blackhawk 1052 tackle box. And I'm sure this thing was super cool once upon a time. I thought it'd be cool to crack this thing open because I haven't utilized it a whole lot um, since the very early days that I fished. And I am sure there are items in here that are 30 or more years old. And I just wanted to sort of go through it with you guys um, so we could see what's in here, what I use, uh, what I've used in the past, not specifically what I recommend, but <laughs> what I've had kicking around in my tackle box for the last 20 or 30 years. Some stuff in here is a little bit newer. Uh, I'm going to try to pick through and find the older stuff, the stuff that I remember being in this tackle box way back in the day when I fished from the beaver dam. Now, we've got a few uh, little lures here. This is one of them with the treble hooks. These are pretty nasty. Uh, I mean, they're all rusted up. And uh, I, at this point, I don't think I would ever use a treble hook with the three hooks, but it seems like that was the style back in the day. These two are definitely OGs, originals to this tackle box. Here's another one. I think this was probably uh, my grandfather's at one point. And uh, it looks like it's a little, it's got a little spinner. And uh, again, it's got the, the triple hook on the end. Very cool little item there. Now, some of these um, are probably originals. Some of these I probably picked up along the way. They're all fairly similar here. It's just the, the spoon style of jig. One's got a double hook. The rest look like they have the triple hooks, but these are really good. Um, I use these a lot actually in salt water. That's probably why they're a little rusted and falling apart, but uh, I, I do believe um, some of these are originals, others are not. All right, what else do we got? We got some weights, we got some swivels, we got more weights. Ah, this is cool. We've got a uh, fish weighing device here. You attach the fish right there, and then it pulls down on the fish 
and then you can measure the weight of your fish. So if you have to get a fish that's at least a pound or two pounds or whatever, uh, if you just want to document it, whatever your catch is, that's that. And it looks like it also has a tape measure built into the side, which is very cool. I don't think I've ever used that, but it is nice to know it's there. Usually um, when I go fishing, I just do catch and release. And so I don't really measure or document. Um, I might take a photo of a fish before I release it, but I don't really care how long it is or how much it weighs, but it is nice to have that there just in case. Looks like we got a few uh, soft baits here. I'm sure there's a bunch of these hanging around. They look like worms. Those are cool. It's another similar one here to the one we looked at at the beginning. I'm sure that's original as well. Uh, oh, okay. We've got a few that look like they are better suited to salt water fishing or fishing for some very large fish. And we've got the triple treble hook there. So when you catch something, you're seriously gonna catch it. And it looks like this one actually has never been used, but I'm sure it's 20 years old or older. <laughs> it's been sitting in there waiting for me to lose this one, but I haven't lost this one yet. So he's ready to go when he's needed. Uh, I do fish in salt water actually primarily now, which is why this tackle box, freshwater tackle box, has pretty much gone unused um, because I don't like to mix the freshwater and the saltwater equipment uh, because it does tend to rust up. So uh, I do have some saltwater gear and that is the majority of the fishing that I do uh, at this point, although it's not very often. This is a cool one too. This is a uh, Shakespeare Sport Fisher. It's got a nice little leather case. Uh, if I was super cool, I could attach this to my belt, I believe. And then uh, this itself allows you to uh, safely grab the hook that's in the fish's mouth. And uh, it'll, it gives you that extra leverage, that extra momentum um, of not having, you know, your fingers directly on the hook. And it allows you to sort of shake that fish off the hook a lot easier. And it does look like it also has a snipper here built into the top, just in case you um, need to cut the line because the hook has been swallowed. So it's a cool tool. I have used this a few times in the past, but um, not regularly. All right, these are cool. <laughs> I don't even know if I don't even know if these are are used anymore, but and I'm not gonna open these because I know these smell. Uh, these are like power baits or crappy baits. Uh, they're the smelly baits that you can add to your uh, your lures to help attract fish. Um, I've used this in the past. It looks like these ones are sort of like a little nugget form and this looks like it's just like a play-doh just like a you know solid block and you just have to sort of grab a little bit of it and attach that to your uh, your hook um, I have caught things with these I do remember using these as a very small child to catch um, small fish again nothing spectacular but if you use just like a small hook like that and a little bit of this um, and a bobber you can do okay catching some small fish. We've got a variety of different uh, fishing line. Eight pound tests, 10 pound tests. So you're not gonna catch any monsters with this fishing kit, but um, you know, big enough to have fun as a kid, right? And then we got some bobbers, very cool. Uh, these things were very helpful uh, as a kid. They're also probably fairly handy in some DIY aquarium projects if you ever want to test those out for different reasons. And then it looks like one of the last things here in the bottom is just the good old 
eagle claw. Just some hooks, some fish hooks of various sizes to attach to your snatch swivels and to help you catch small fish with small mouths. Anyways guys, that is a quick look at what is in my freshwater tackle box. Again, this hasn't been touched a whole lot um, since I was a child, but I do use it on occasion and uh, I do still carry it around with me when I go on trips and whatnot. So it's always nice to have uh, a kit and uh, this one here has certainly stood the test of time. So that is what is in my tackle box. All right, now we're up on the hill, up away from the water and check this out. This is a gigantic lumber yard and this was all woods. In fact, the trees that you see around them are all original and this used to be completely packed with trees of the same size. And also there are skitter trails all throughout these woods here in every direction where they were able to uh, pull more logs out of the woods and bring them here into this lumber yard. And if you take a look at this road, this road is completely new. This used to be all woods and now it's completely open and they brought in uh, dump trucks and dump trucks full of gravel just to build these new roads way down into the woods and then they leave these sections open here to dump all of the trees until they're ready to uh, grab them and put them on a truck and get them out of here but this road continues down into the woods and there are several more of these wood lots just like this one where they just stack the trees up stack them up until they're full and then they bring the trucks in so this area is completely transformed. This used to just be complete wilderness, no road, no access, just full grown trees as far as the eye can see. And now we've got a giant road running right through this area. It's quite the transformation. guys and that's gonna do it for this week's video I hope you had fun coming on a small adventure with me this week into the woods to go see what is going on out there I also hope you learned a little bit about alder cones and where they can be found and what they look like and we got to see what was in my ancient old tackle box Anyways guys, we've got a lot more to do down in the fish room. I've got a list of DIY projects lined up. We're gonna get started on those as soon as we can for next week's video. So, hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you guys later.